This is the Roaring Meg waterfall. And it's just below Cooktown, right in the heart of the rainforest country. You can tell why it's called the Roaring Meg. And in wet season time, when it's in full swing, all this rock surface is covered with water. And it races away, and it drops about 3,000 feet. That's about 1,000 metres in funny talk, right down to the coastline. Way back in the olden days, early 20s in that period, when the first original tin scratches and tin miners came up here, they used this water and the runoff from it to wash their tin. They did channels all the way around the mountainside and used and channeled the water to wash out the tin. tin miners who came into this scrub country were looking for riches. Life would have been pretty unpleasant when they lived here. It was wet all the time and of course they had this great big canopy which cut out most of the sunlight. The Aboriginals on the other hand had come to grips with this environment. They knew by looking around the place what they could find to get themselves the food that they needed and of course the water that they needed. That's quite a contrast to what those early tin miners found. They were quite out of their element and out of their depth, but even today, when we go back into the scrub, we can find the remains of their occupation in that country. I reckon these tin scratcher blokes that were up here, they would have had to cart all this sort of stuff from Bloomfield. They probably carted it on their backs or maybe even used pack horses. Also had to cart all their food. But they probably didn't realise that... There we go. Right outside their front door, they had these little rainforest figs growing. And you can eat them, they're edible. They did make some attempt to grow local foods and always ran tin... Huts like this, you're likely to find banana bushes, and there's one over there with bananas on it. Pretty scruffy looking one, but it's worthwhile. Apart from banana bushes, you'll also find chilies. <sighs> Look at these little fellas. They use the chilies to chuck into the stew, just to flavour the meat a bit. And they really have a bit of a bite to them. They're hot. I reckon they'd keep you regular, though. You get a real idea of how tough the life was for those early miners when you look around a clearing like this. All of the scrub that once grew here had to be cut away. And all of that work was done by hand. Looking around the place, I can't see any other food trees around the joint. What I can see are these gullies here. And these gullies carried the water for the tin miners from the Roaring Meg way back in the scrub line, maybe two or three kilometres. You've got to be a bit careful because the ferns that are growing out of them disguise the depth. And when you get down to gullies like this one here, this is the master gully. It looks, oh, crikey, you'd lose yourself down there. It looks to be about five foot deep. Hang on. Oh. And it is. Ah, ah, it's just full of ferns and weeds. And I would have hate to have had to work to dig it out. It's only about a foot wide and very cramped. Hello. Ah, somebody else has been, been in here. 
That's a python skin. Obviously, shedding his skin down here. There's a bit more of it. I think I better get out of here. This is the northern edge of what was once called the Big Scrub. Now, it was called the Big Scrub because it went all the way back south, about 450 kilometres, right back as far as Townsville. These days, it's broken up into pockets, and that's occurred because of farming and settlement. This trip will take me almost to the very top of Cape York Peninsula, looking for bush tucker. Of course, to survive in any environment, you need more than food. You've also got to have water and, of course, shelter. But water around here in a rainforest environment is not really very difficult to find. In fact, during the wet season, I wouldn't be able to drive through here because all of these creeks would be running a banker. Way back in the beginning, when I first started to research bush tucker, I started in this environment, the rainforest. And the reason for that was the fact that I was most familiar with this sort of country. When I was a bit of a kid, I grew up to the south of here, in rainforest country. So I knew all about it. Well, I thought I did at the time, anyway. A few years later, that background and that information held me in good stead because the army sent me off to Vietnam. Looking at bush tucker in an environment like this is not as difficult as you might imagine, because once you look around a bit and look into the forest instead of at it, there's tucker everywhere. See these? They're candle nuts. And you can find them lying on the floor all around this whole area. They're very common in the rainforest. You can eat these as well, and they taste absolutely superb. I'll break one open and show you. Oh, killed that one. There it is. That white pulp tastes very, very similar. Mm to macadamia nut. They can also be used back in the campfire, so I'll take some back and use these tonight, back at camp. I met a fellow one time who told me about these things. Well, I didn't actually meet him. He, he'd been dead about 100 years now, but I read his diary anyway. What do you reckon? was that when he was working in the scrub country, he could track the Aboriginal movement because of the seeds out of these things. What they'd do is open them up, chew them up, get a bit of a taste of them, and then spit them out. And by all the spittings all around the place, you could see where the Aboriginals were moving. There's a fellow called uh, Christy Palmerston. Not only can you eat the seeds though, you can get into the root system. And that's worthwhile because this is the ginger plant and it's a great food additive and food flavouring. Yeah. Mm. Rocky ground, ginger likes rocks. Ooh. I 
like that old bit off. That's the ginger root itself. Tuck that away. That's what you're after. It's great to put in your tucker. Flavors up your fish or whatever you got on. And it lasts for weeks, so you can carry it with you. Just exactly how Aboriginal people worked out what you could eat and what you couldn't is very, very difficult to judge. Maybe they used a method of trial and error over many, many years. One thing's for sure though, here in the scrub country, looks of a plant or food can be very deceptive. Now here's something you've got to look out for in the scrub country. This is a stinging tree. And of all the products you can find in the rainforest here, this one has got to be the worst. Because if you touch the leaves or the branches or the twigs, you get very, very severely stung. And that sting, it does, doesn't last just a day or an hour. It lasts for weeks and sometimes months. But this time of year, it got its fruit on it. It looks a little bit like mulberry or something like that. In fact, you can eat them, but uh, I reckon that the, the trauma of trying to get at them and the chances of being stung are too much, so I'll leave them alone. If you look very closely at this leaf here, you can see all these fine hairs just sticking up. Those hairs are in fact hollow, and they've got a slight injection that they give you once they stick into you. Right, they're all over the surface there, both the top surface and underneath. I reckon it's too dangerous to play around with myself. As you travel north, it's not long before the rainforest begins to peter out. And then quite suddenly, right on the edge of the scrub country, you come across this amazing rock formation mysterious and sinister Black Mountain. Geologists reckon the mountain was created by volcanic activity, a great pile of black rock. It looks almost like an enormous slag heap. Aboriginal people have got a legend for it. They reckon that the Dreamtime spirits piled up these rocks stacking them right up, one on top of the other, all in readiness for man's arrival. That's granite. <sighs> Look at that. These are the Black Mountains just near Cooktown. And it's composed of all these ginormous big granite boulders, all sitting stacked one on top of the other. In fact, you've got to be careful when you're climbing up here because it's got holes and caverns and caves all around the place and you can fall down as easy as anything. There's some stories around that a few white fellas that came up here and tried to explore in here never came out again. Principally policemen and people running from the police. The problem is they crawl in underneath, get lost, can't see any daylight and can't find their way out again. Aboriginals had similar sorts of stories. One goes that there's a whole tribe came through here at one time, crawled in here to hide 
and only half them managed to find their way out. They also tell us that on a windy day, you can hear them calling out, trying to find their way out again. It'll take me two days to drive up north to a place called Iron Range. And up there, we've got the second major rainforest patch in North Queensland. To get there, I've got to cross this open savanna, this dry country. And most of Cape York area is made up of this sort of environment. It looks pretty harsh, and in fact, some of the early explorers perished in this country. This road didn't exist 20 years ago, and it's only in more recent times that the roads have begun to appear. There's talk that one day they'll put in a bitumen road, but I'm pretty happy the way things are now. This is Iron Range, and there's a pretty good reason for calling it that. They found minerals here. Those minerals didn't prove to be economical, and so far, no mining's gone on here. And it remains a very good natural rainforest. One of the first requirements in the scrub country is shelter. And if you get stuck out here without a tent, or as we call it in the army, a hoochie, you can knock one up out of the scrub itself. It's a technique that Aboriginal people perfected. This stuff here is that lawyer vine. And what they do with that is stick it in the ground like that. And then over this side here, they make a whole bunch of rafters out of this stuff. Like this. These days, white people use the same lawyer vine for making the uh, cane furniture. A few years ago, it was used in schools all over Australia for giving you a flogging. I remember it well. Yeah. They'd get the structure up like that. Then they'd perhaps weave a few things in and out of the frames. Put another one there just to make sure that it works. You can see it's got a whole igloo sort of effect to it. And I'd weave around some rafters, that's pretty rough. Pull it in there a little bit. I'll just sit it there for the moment. And then they'd use the banana leaves to put the covering over the whole thing. And for a one night stand, it was pretty good. Did the job. you'd be flat out finding an unattractive rainforest stream, even though they're always very, very shallow. But it's surprising what you can find in the water. It could be eels or fish or even turtle. Sometimes if you're very lucky, you can even get some yabbies. One way you can catch a yabby is by using raw meat just like this. What you do is put the meat into the, uh, an old leaf, just bind him up, turn him over a bit, make him tight, then bung it in the middle of a bit of grass like that. Just close him up tight like that. I was shown this by an Aboriginal bloke a few years ago. And you get a bunch of sticks like that, just place them around the outside. They help keep the whole thing together a bit. And the principle is that the yabby crawls up inside here and gets caught. And when you pull it out, oh, it's a bit big. I'm not sure when you pull it out, that's going to weigh it down when I put it in the water, by the way. When you pull it out, the yabby can't escape the trap quickly enough, and so he's caught in there. Once you've got your bundle like that, 
Just wind him round a bit like this. And tie a knot so it doesn't come to bits. And there's your yabby trap. Just like that. And you put him in the water somewhere where you had a bit of root system. Because the yabby's hide under the bank in the roots of the trees that go along the edge of the creek. I think I'll put this one in just over here. I'll leave that there for a few hours. Oh, see those fellas there? When they got bigger, their mums and dads became tucker in the past. Catch them like that, take them up, cook them, and they provide a feed. Mind you, most snakes that I've eaten, you don't really get that much meat off the body. Because what tends to happen is that the, the cage fills out this little fellow's a harmless little bloke. I'm giving him a bit of a hard time here. The rib cage fills out and takes up all the bulk, and there's not really that much meat on them. We'll just let this bloke go. He wouldn't even be a snack. There he goes. Water snakes like this are quite often found around the waterways, but it's surprising in the scrub country how few animals and birds you actually see. A lot of them are nocturnal. During the day, it's the patterns and the vegetation that capture your eyes. Oh, there's oh, hello. And the loft in that one. No, there he is there. See him tangled up. There he goes. Steady, steady. You know, because these, uh, that's a bit hot. Because these yabbies are uh, related to the saltwater prawn group, they look very similar once they're cooked up. See them? Look exactly the same as the prawn you get out in the ocean. And taste very similar as well. Just gonna peel this fella and put him into the the pot there because I got a bit of rice boiling away there. A little bit of protein won't do any harm. He peels just like a normal prawn. There you go, peel off the back just the same. Break him up a bit. Put him in there. Just chop up a couple of little bits of ginger. 
couple of bits. It's fairly strong tasting ginger, so you don't need all that much of it. And boil that away. I've also got here some candle nuts, the ones I collected out in the forest floor. And what I've done is thread them, after cracking them open, onto some little bits of wire. Now I'm going to put those candle nuts in the fire and just leave them there for a little bit. I want to really get nice and hot. You see, those nuts are very, very high in energy. I think they're about 2,600 kilojoules. That's a lot when you compare it with something like honey, which is only about 1,400. They're high for one particular reason, and that's the fat content which is contained within the nut. The other business about that fat is the fact that it's flammable. And the old squatters and tin miners and gold scratchers used to get them and do the exact same thing that I'm doing now with them, and then hang them up. There we go. hang them up around the place as substitutes for candles. So you see in the scrub country, we've got our tucker and a bit of shelter. And we've even got our own light source. And who could ask for more than that?